Amen. Well, as I was praying through the message today and just trying to figure out what to talk about, um, a word that continued to come up was the word hope. That every single time I came to ask God, God, what do you want me to talk about? Just the word hope came up. And I, I feel like this is very fitting for us because hope allows us to believe that what is ahead of us is actually better than what's behind us. That we're going to finish this year well by, by having hope that, that this next year is going to be something potentially different, potentially better. Um, I was actually out to eat with my wife this week, uh, El Sol and Waverly. We love El Sol. Um, woo, some people know. It's so good. It's so good. Um, we were sitting down eating, and she just looked up at me at some point, and she goes, is this just me, or has this last year been really hard? And I was like, no, it's not just you. Like, yeah, this year's been pretty brutal. She goes, no, like, one of the worst years I've had. It's like, no, I would agree with that, too. And we're just talking, and there were some things that happened to us this year that were just out of our control. Some things that happened because of us, some things that we just did, and we were kind of reaping the, the benefits and the repercussions of, that there were just some things that happened this year. And this year was just one that, for some reason, was just a lot more difficult than I than I anticipated it to be. That this, this year has ended a lot differently than I thought it would at the beginning. And I am, I'm going to just start off by just saying as much as anybody, I am excited for 2024. I am ready to close the chapter on this, and I'm excited to just step into this new year. And I want to just start off by just being honest about this, because church is the best place we can be honest. There is no place that we can truly be honest like we can at church. And, and, and I get it saying that in a room that, of people that, for some of us, we understand that, and some we don't. So, some we agree with that, and some we're like, eh, I don't know. But the thing is, church is the best place to be honest. Because this is truly the place where we're, we can be fully known. See, I was in, inviting some people to church, and, uh, and one person said, yeah, you know what, I, I really want to come to church, but, but I just got to get my... Hey, hey, I got some stuff that I just got to deal with in here before I come to God. Hey, my, my life is too messy to show up in church. Or, or one of my favorites, I can't come to church. That place will burn down when I walk through. See, we have this idea that, that we have to come to God a certain way. We have this idea and this, this kind of preconceived notion that, that there's this expectation put on us that before we come to God, we have to do this, 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 and this. But it's, that's not at all what the Bible teaches us. That actually the Bible teaches us this. There were two men that went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, just being a religious leader, was standing there and praying like this about himself. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people greedy, unrighteous adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector standing off would not even look up to heaven. But he kept striking his chest saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, from the very words of Jesus, there is hope. There's hope that no matter what we've walked in with today, our yesterdays are not going to define our tomorrows. Whatever mistakes we've, we've made up until this point, whatever this last year has looked like, there's still hope that the future is going to be bright. I just, I just want to clear the air and give some people permission today. If you have walked in church today, on your last leg, have nothing else left, you feel like this year has taken everything from you, you feel like you're broken beyond repair. You feel like you have nothing left. You feel like you are just limping in here, just looking for your one last shot. You have nothing left. Can I just give you some reassurance that that is the perfect place for God to do something? Because when we have nothing, you start to realize that God is all you need. When you have nothing else, you start to realize that God is actually all we've ever needed. See, I don't, I don't have good ideas to come up with today, God. I don't have any more strength to put towards this. God, I don't have any more ideas. God, I don't have anything else. He said, perfect. I can do something with that. So if you're in here today, and you're just maybe like me, and you're like, man, I, I'm, I'm really at the end of it. I want to promise you that today God, God can do something with that. I want to share a couple stories with you guys today to help us just understand this. And the first story I want to share is a story of a man named Jacob. Uh, Jacob's story takes place in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And this man is a man who is the poster child for making mistakes and not learning from it. That, that as you read his stories just time and time and time again, this man just makes mistake after mistake after mistake and just continues to fall short. That it starts off with this man, his name is Jacob, and that actually means deceiver. And he starts off by deceiving his older brother Esau. See, back in, in this time, just a little historical context, the older brother had rights, responsibilities, and, and benefits that the younger brothers didn't. And so the older brother had these, these benefits that the younger brother actually manipulated him out of. And his, his father, who was on his deathbed dying, just in a complete wreck, he actually lied to his father, deceived his father, and stole more from his older brother. 
And as he's doing this, he actually becomes overwhelmed and he, and he flees from his brother. He runs away out of fear that his brother's going to kill him. And as he's fleeing, he meets this woman, falls in love with this woman, and he approaches the father-in-law and wants to marry this woman. And all of a sudden, the deceiver becomes the deceived because the father-in-law actually gave him a different woman. And then the woman that he's fallen in love with is not his wife. And then he begins to have kids, and then he has family drama, baby mama drama, and everything starts to fall apart. And this guy's life is just time after time, mistake after mistake, shortcoming after shortcoming, and everything falls apart. And it seems like nothing is going right for this guy. Some stuff that was his fault, some stuff that wasn't. And it gets to a point where in the middle of it, on the road as he's running away, he falls asleep and God speaks to him. And God actually gives him this dream, and, and, and in this dream, God says, I'm going to use you. I'm, I'm going to use your life for good. There's things that I want to do through you that I haven't done before. That actually I want to, I want to bless your family, I want to bless you for generations, that I'm going to choose you to start my chosen people. The people that are my prized possession, it's going to start with you, Jacob. And he gives him this, this great promise. And he gives him this great hope that in the middle of everything that God is still going to use him. Fast forward to Jacob's story, and his past catches up with him in a very literal way. His brother is actually waiting for him, his older brother. And his men come back, and they send where they say, Jacob, your, your brother is waiting ahead with 400 men. And in fear, he, he sends his belongings ahead. He sends his family ahead. He sends his friends ahead. He sends everything that he has ahead of him to pacify his brother's rage and hopefully spare his life. And as he sends everybody ahead, he's left all alone. He's left there in the night with nothing else. And I can only imagine what Jacob was going through in that moment, just starting to think of all the mistakes that he'd made, of the places that he'd gone through that got him to this point, the shame that he felt just overwhelmed with the man that he had become, in that place just completely alone, completely isolated, but in that place with just still a glimmer of hope. I want to pick up this story in Genesis 32. It says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip, hip socket, and they wrestled and as it dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name, the man said. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. See, this story is, is one of my personal favorites in the Bible because of two, two reasons. The first one is that I feel like this is one of the stories that not only tells why God does something, but actually tells how he does something as well. That it gives a clear picture of, of really just how God works. But, but second, it's, it's because in a lot of ways, I am Jacob. See, there's been points in my life where I have, I have lied and deceived my way to get to a place that I didn't deserve to be. There have been points in my life where I have lied and manipulated people to get out of situations that I got myself into. There have been points where I've been too big of a coward to actually uh, approach the things that I've done wrong to take accountability for them. There's been points where I have just not been the man, the man that God called me to be. That, that as I read Jacob's story, I see a lot of myself in it. And when I was 16, I actually had hip surgery. Um, my hip, just born with a birth defect, and my hip kind of pops out of socket. And when I was 16, I had to have surgery where it basically just is reconstructed. And I remember being at home, and my parents moved a, uh, a hospital bed into their bedroom. And I couldn't go to school. I couldn't really do anything but just lay in bed all day. And I remember the one day my uh, siblings were all at school. My parents were working. I was at home by myself. And I remember thinking, well, this is probably as good a time as any to pray. So I prayed and opened my Bible, and I just so happened to open to this story. And I read about this man that also had a limp. He had some issues. But I read about a, a, a man in a story that was redeemed. That no matter how bad it got, no matter how dark his days got, that there was still hope, that there was still more that God could do. And that's why I love this story so much, is because we can't look at our lives and think we've messed it up too much. Because when we look at this, we see the exact opposite. We see that God can take the most messed up, the most screwed up, the most broken, sinful man and do something incredible. My uh, old church, there was an old man. Um, and he was, he was the kind of guy that always had a little saying. He always had a little something to say about everything. But it was always about the, five same, the same five sayings. And one of the things he always used to say is, boy, God can, God can draw straight lines with crooked sticks, can he? I said, yeah, yes he can. And it would just always come up at random times like, man, I tell you what, God can still draw straight lines with crooked sticks. He takes the most messed up people and he can, he can still do something good, can he? And that's true, isn't it? Some of us, we've seen that personally in our lives. 
we've seen the, the best that we can give God and God do something miraculous with it. But here's the thing. A crooked stick on its own is just a crooked stick. Our, our lives and our best attempt by ourselves is just our best attempt. But it's when we put that into the hands of God that things start to change. That, that without God, that we're just, we're stuck. We're kind of left in our, in our own place. We're stuck in our brokenness and we're, we're just stuck in our weakness and things that we just can't seem to get right. 2 Corinthians 12 says this, Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, in insults, in hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. As a man, as a husband, as a father, as just simply a human being, there are a few things I hate as much I, I hate as much as being weak. I, I just I can't stand being weak. There are a few things that scare me as much as being weak. The fear that I might not know what to do terrifies me. The fear that the people that, I, that love me would rely on me and I not be able to help them scares me. The fear that I might become a burden or be too much for somebody and that, that I might not be able to provide for myself and do the things on my own is just the most terrifying thing I can think of. I hate weakness. I absolutely avoid weakness at every point of my life. And to be honest with you, that's probably one of the biggest struggles I have with God. That is probably the issue that I come up against all the time. Is God saying, hey, hey, it's in your weakness I can do things. And I'm like, I don't want to be weak. I'm not going to be weak. Hey, I, I can be the guy with good ideas. Hey, I can be strong enough. Hey, I can do this. I can do this, God, but I'm not going to be weak. But here's the thing. Weakness is incredibly necessary for all of us. Because what weakness does is it humbles us. And humility gives God room to work. Humility puts us in a place, or weakness puts us in a place of humility and acknowledging that we don't have all that it takes. We don't have the best ideas. We can't do this on our own. And in that moment, God can actually do something incredible. See, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. As parents of, of little kids, we know this, right? You, we see this all the time. We see, we see our kids doing things that we're just looking at. We're like, oh, that's not going to end well. And it's like, it's like we're just watching, you know exactly what's going to happen, but they're just determined to do it on their own. You're just, they're just determined to do it. My son, I'm like, hey, can I help you? He's like, no, 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 no. I'm like, okay, you're going to ask for help in a second, you're going to cry. And it's like, we're just, we're just watching them do these things on their own, and you're just sitting there waiting, you're like, man, I could help you, I could help you, I could help you do this. But they just refuse to ask for help. They're, they're, it's, in a way, it's, their pride is saying, no, I can do this on my own. But what happens is they can't do it on their own. They mess it up, they fall apart, and then the tears, they come, Mama, Dada, and they just need help. In a way, that's, that's them humbling themselves. They say, hey, I can't do this on my own. And it's silly, but, but we're the same way. We're just big kids that pay bills and taxes. We, we look at situations, we know, we have no idea what we're doing. We're like, I'm going to do my best, I'm going I'm to make it happen. And after a while, we're like, God, I need your help. I really messed that up. But the thing is, he's a good father. He is a good parent. He is there to help us every single time. He's not there to be like, I told you better. No, he's like, hey, hey, come here, I got you. Hey, I, I know that was too much for you. Hey, I got you. Hey, hey, let me, let me do this for you. See, in, in, our, in our need, in our best attempts, we fail. We fall short. And when we fall short, we cry out to God and we just say, God, I need your help. God, I need you to do something in this situation. But here's the thing, he listens every single time. I called to the Lord in my distress, and I cried to my God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. No matter where we are, no matter what you go through, no matter what you've done, when we cry out to God, he hears us. Because he's a good father, he cares about his children. So it's, it's in those moments that we cry out for God for help, and he gives us hope and he restores us. But he doesn't just restore us and make that situation right. He actually makes something beautiful out of it. Because, see, we're not just talking about spilling a little bit of water or messing up a couple things. That, that some of us, we've messed up our lives pretty badly. We, we have done some really, really stupid things that have got us into some really bad situations. Jacob's just like anybody. Jacob got himself into a bunch of situations that just got him to a point where he was afraid for his life. Where he had nobody and nothing around him. Except just a little bit of hope. And with that little bit of hope and, and him crying out to God, God did something miraculous. See, it, it was kind of like, 
like an anchor. Like through everything, he was just, he was just holding on tight. He was just holding on with all that he had. When he deceived his brother, he put himself in a position that he was messing up really bad. That was all his fault. He said, God, I know you can still do something with this. I know this isn't your doing, but God, you can do something with this. God, I'm not going to let go. I'm, I'm going to hold on to hope that something will get better from this. As he's being deceived and, and his family is falling apart and everything's going wrong, he's holding on and says, God, you said you were going to use my family for generations. That for my family, there will be uh, chosen people. God, I'm going to hold on to that promise. I'm going to hold on to that hope that, that that's it. this thing can still work. And that night as he's wrestling with God, for all night, he's holding on. He's saying, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go until God gives me what he said he was going to give me. I'm not letting go until I see this hope restored. I'm not letting go until this thing is made right. And even when he said, hey, let me go, he said, I'm not letting go. I am not letting go. As his hands were burning, holding on to hope, he said, I am not letting go. And, that, and that's what that means for each of us, that, that when times get hard, it's just hope is just simply this rope that we hold on to. It just says, the storm is bad. I don't know how my family's going to get through this. I don't know if my marriage is going to survive this. I don't know if I'm going to survive this, but I'm not letting go. As dark as this is, as painful as this is, I am not letting go. And the beautiful thing is, is God restored him. See, Jacob, after he got done wrestling with God, he, he got up that morning, he manned up, and he started walking. It was a little bit of a limp from the night before. A little bit of a limp, and he, and he met his brother. And his brother saw him from a long way off, and he, he chased after him and threw his arms around him, and they both weeped and cried. Because his brother was just excited to see his family home. And all the gifts that he had given his brother, his brother said, no, 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 this, this isn't for me. This, this is your stuff. See, God had chosen to bless Jacob. Even in the midst of his sin, even in the midst of his deceit, even in the midst of everything that he had done, done wrong, he said, I'm still going to use you. And Jacob actually went on to have a couple sons, and those sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, which if, uh, for those guys that don't know, those are God's chosen people today. When we talk about the Israelite people, it all started with this man. See, God didn't just restore him and give him a little bit of hope. God actually used his story to do something completely different and to do something incredible. God transformed this man over time, but it all started with just a little bit of hope. Because stories of hope were just simply stories of transformation. The hope that, that my life could look a little different. The hope that God can do something with my brokenness. The hope that God can do something with the mess that I've given him. But it's not just Jacob. There's, there's tons of people with stories like this. In this room even. I think of, I think of Joe. Front row. Joe, Joe has, a, has a story in the past. He's gone through some stuff. Some stuff that's happened to him and some stuff that he's, he's done himself. But it, it got him to a place where he was in a, in a, in a in just an incredibly dark place, but he held on to hope. He held on to the belief that it's not going to end here, that, that God could still do something with this. And God has restored Joe in incredible ways, and he's leading in an incredible high capacity at this church. He's going to be uh, security over at our new building, and I'm excited for that. And God has just restored you in incredible ways because you didn't lose hope. I think of Randy. Where's Randy at? He's in here as well. Yeah, we love Randy. Randy's the same way. He, he's a man with a past. And it's his story to tell, but he's done things that he's not proud of. And if you ask him, it was a lot of things that he really messed up in his life and just made things really hard. But he held on to hope. And he held on to the belief that, that God can do something with this. And now Randy is, he's leading our security team, but he is pastoring people at this church at a very high level. He is taking care of people and loving people and, and restoring them into something different as well. I think of Charlena. Charlena Shattuck. I said I was going to try to make you cry. I'm going to cry. I remember sitting in that hospital with you guys when your mom died. I remember sitting there looking across at this little girl, just broken. Mom was suddenly gone and her world was shattered. And she didn't have much, but she had just, just a little bit of hope. Just a little bit of hope that tomorrow might be better than today. And that little girl grew into an incredible woman. And I, I can confidently say your mom would be proud of you today. Your mom would be proud of the woman that you are today. And it's because even in the darkness, there was just that little bit of hope. Tomorrow's going to be better than today. I don't know what tomorrow holds, 
I don't know how I'm going to get through it, but I'm going to hold on. See, God, God changes God changes us because he has a story for us. He has a purpose for us. And I told you guys, I, I love this story because it tells us why God does things, but it also tells us how. See, God, God changes us because there's nobody that's too far gone. There's nobody that is too far from God. And he shows us how, actually, in a, in a really beautiful way, because here's the thing. Hope is, is kind of like a journey. We begin to have hope. We begin to believe that things are going to be different. We begin to, to believe that God can do things, and we begin to just go on this journey of saying, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk this path. I'm going to see what you can do. And on this journey, we're actually going to come up against some things. We're going to, we're going to kind of hit these, these markers, if you will, that, that are just reminders to us that we're, we're on the right path, that the hope that we have, that, that it is leading us in the right direction. And the first place that we'll come to is that we'll start to see God change our world. We'll start to see God change our world, change our environment. This is just simply the, the place that we're at whether it's the relationships we have, whether it's the, the physical place that we're at, whether it's our mindset, whatever it is, God starts to change those things because he actually moves us out of that place into something new because the, the place that we're in isn't necessarily conducive for what God wants to do. I, uh, I talked about her last service, but there's uh, one of our students, her name is Penny Dean. Uh, she, they, they actually moved here from New Jersey uh, a couple years ago, and I remember talking to her right away, and she was not excited. Moved from New Jersey to Iowa, and she, she just didn't want to be here. But I remember talking to her a couple weeks ago, and I said, hey, remember when you moved and you hated it here? And she's like, yeah, I do. I didn't, want to do. I didn't want anything to do with anybody. She said, but I now understand why I moved to Iowa. It's because of this church. She said, I, I, I came to this church, and I found friends like I've never had before. I found community like I've never had before. I've started to, to connect with God like I've never connected before. She goes, this church was my purpose. I needed this church, and if I wouldn't have left New Jersey, I wouldn't have been able to find this. See, she didn't understand it in the moment, but God was moving her out of where she was, a physical location, and taking her somewhere else and said, hey, I know this is going to be hard, but I have something really beautiful for you there. See, and God actually uses the analogy of a, uh, of a garden or a farm to help us understand this. It says, then he told the many saying, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. See, God will at some point remove us from where we're at, into the place that we need to be. Because we can have all the hope we want, but if, if the seeds of hope are being buried or are being planted in bad soil, they're never going to grow. And God's actually going to move us into a place where the, the things that he wants to do, the, the prayers that we've been praying, we want to move it to a place where he can actually answer those things. The second thing is that God actually changes our walk. Something Pastor Q says to me a lot is, uh, never follow a man who doesn't walk with a limp. Never follow a man who doesn't walk with a limp. Because a man with a limp is somebody that's walked through some stuff. They've walked through some hard situations. They've walked through some battles, but the thing is they haven't just walked through it, they've come out on the other side. That that limp is an indicator that they, they fought some wars. They've been through some very difficult times. And so when we follow somebody with a limp, we're following somebody that's, they've been in the battle. They understand what it's like to go through the things that you're going through. And when we, when we follow somebody with a limp, it, it's, it's, it's that reminder to us that God can still do something. See, for Jacob, he, he was a man who walked with a limp. The sun shone on him as he passed by Peniel, limping because of his hip. This man wrestled with God. In an instant, his life was transformed. But he was different after that. He walked a little bit different with a limp. There was just, there was just something about him that was different. And, and here's the thing, I need you guys to catch this. The reason he walked with a limp was by God's design. God didn't give him an ailment that nobody else could see. God didn't give him a rib that was just a little bit sore that, that he just kind of felt by himself that nobody else noticed. No, he gave him something very visible that everybody else could see. Because that limp was a reminder for him for, that he had, he had gone through something and he was a new man now. 
that that limp was his constant reminder, like, no, I have walked through this. I have come out the other side, and I'm a different man. But it was not just for him. It was for those around him. Because the people around him knew who he was. They had spent their lives with this man. They knew who Jacob was. They knew he was a deceiver. They knew he was a liar. They knew the things that he'd done to people. But then they knew what God did in that moment in the man that was there afterwards. And so that limp was Jacob's reminder, but it was also everybody else's reminder that God can still do anything. And I just want to assure you today that God can still do anything. Because your story has power, purpose, and potential to change lives. But here's the thing. You can't hide your limp. We can't hide the parts of us that God has transformed. See, God has, has brought some of you through tremendous things. And you're out on the other side, but now it's like, man, that's in the past and I'm done with that. That, that pain is gone and I'm not dealing with that anymore. But God is saying, what if I could use that pain? What if I could take that pain and actually give it purpose? See, you think what you walked through is just because you had to walk through that, but what if I want to use that to change somebody's life? Who else better to help somebody go through it than what, than what you had to go through? I think of, I think of Danny High. He leads our uh, grief share, one of our MCs. A man who has had to go through grief, who has had to walk through loss, helping other people walk through loss and grief. I think of Joe and I think of Mark and Randy. I think of men that have had to walk through dealing with their past, dealing with issues, dealing with addictions and things like that, coming out on the other side and helping other men and women walk through those same things. Who better to help than you? You think that thing that happened to you was just there to happen to you, but God's saying, hey, I want to use that. You, you're, you're trying to hide it. You're, you're trying to hide that pain, afraid of what might happen. But God's saying, hey, just, just trust me with it. Trust me with that difficult part of your story and see what I can do. Because here's the thing, I'm not just going to change your life, I'm going to change the lives of those around you. See, it's, it's one thing to, to kind of put on a face and to make it look good. Pastor Q always says, I, I, I want to make sure I'm honest. Because the worst thing that happens is people show up in a room like this and they see the guy on stage and everything's perfect. And everything's great and there's never any issues. But then what happens is when we start to have our first bad day, we think, well, they don't have those. There must be something wrong with me. See, when we expose our weakness and we're willing to say, hey, I don't have it all together, it gives everybody else around you freedom to just say, okay, I can be broken too. I'm not the only one. The last thing is that God changes our identity. Genesis 32, 28 says, Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and you have prevailed. Now this is one of the most difficult points on the journey. This is one of the most difficult points we're going to come to, but make no mistake, this is one of the best points we get to. See, after we get to this, things start to look completely different. But it's in this place that real sacrifice starts to take place. Because Jesus doesn't come to make us better, but to make us brand new. Jesus' goal isn't to make you a better version of yourself, to make you a little bit more patient, a little bit more kind, a little bit more generous, a little less mean. No, his goal is to make us something brand new. Because the problem is, is, is if he makes us brand new, the old us is still there. Hey, I can make you a little bit more kind, but the selfish one that got you into the situation is still there. Hey, I can make you a little bit more patient, but the angry one is, is still there. Hey, I can do all these things, but the old us is still there. And at some point, they're, they're going to come back up. So God says, no, no, no. I want to do something brand new. I want to make you brand new. Not 2.0, not new and improved. No, brand new. And, and this, this is a hard place to be. Because it's, it's not always, it's not always the, the bad that we we leave, but sometimes it's, it's some good things as well. But God is saying, hey, I, I have something better for you. I have something better that I, that I want to give you. See, our lives are they're ours. God has entrusted each of us with them. Some of us, our lives have looked different than others, and kind of like this box. Some boxes are just a little bit dinged up. Got some imperfections. It ain't pretty, but it's mine. This is my life. And all of its imperfections. 
And God is saying, hey, I want you to, I want you to give this to me. I want you to take this thing that you're holding on to and I want you to give it to me and I, I have something else I want to give you. I want to make an exchange. I, I want to take this life that you have and, and the things that you think you need and I, I want to give you something different. But we've worked really hard for this, right? It may not be perfect, it may not be pretty, but, but we've worked hard for this. We, we know what's in here. Th- this is ours. <laughs> God, this is my life. God, God, what if what's in there isn't what I like? God, what if, what if the thing that's in here isn't in there? God, this is just a dirty, busted box. That's not a fair trade. You don't, you don't want this. But he's saying, just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust that I want this. And that I have something way better to give you. And I know it's hard. I know this isn't an easy thing to do. He said, but I just want you to trust me. And I know you're going to want this back at times, and and you know what? That's okay. The gift is still there. The gift is always going to be available. But but I just want you to take the gift. I want you to take this new life, and I want you to give me your old one. messy and as broken as it is with all of its imperfections God says I want that I want to to give you something different one of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Matthew and it says then Jesus said to his disciples if anyone wants to follow after me let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life because of me will find it For what will it benefit someone to gain the whole world yet to lose his soul? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his soul? See, Jesus' disciples and the people he was talking to in the moment didn't fully understand what he was saying. But basically what he was saying is, hey, I want you to do what I'm about to do. Because Jesus, a little while later, was actually led to a cross where he hung on that cross, was beaten, died, three days later rose again. But it all started last week with Christmas. Christmas, we celebrate hope coming into the world. Jesus being the hope that that we've all been waiting for. But Jesus came into a pretty hopeless world. See, after after Adam and Eve have sinned, then then all of a sudden there was a separation between God and man. And the life that God had for us and and the life that we were living, that there was this separation. And in people's attempts to to bring God closer and to get back to where they're supposed to be, that they did everything they could. They they found kings, they found leaders, and they found people that would lead them back to God, but these people became corrupt. They found uh, these laws, and they followed these laws and did everything they could to make sure they do the right thing and not the wrong thing, but there were just too many laws, and they just couldn't follow them, and they just kept getting it wrong. And when they got it wrong, they, they tried these sacrifices, but these sacrifices were never enough, and it seemed like they always had to keep going back to it. There were these men that had these great ideas, but the ideas always fell short. There are these people with their best attempts, but their best attempts were never good enough. And Jesus entered into the situation of a people doing their very best, but it just wasn't enough. And Jesus was born, and hope began. Because Jesus went on to, to lead people, to teach people, but then more than anything, to actually guide people, to guide people back to God. You see, and, and on that path back to God, It led him to being hated, betrayed, mocked, beaten, and hung on a cross to die. An innocent man hung on a cross to die for things he didn't do. But in his innocence, he took on our guilt. He took on our shame. He took on the the sins that we had committed. He took on the things that didn't belong to us. He took on our old life. And he said, all of this, everything that you've done wrong, everything that you're going to do wrong, everything that separates you from God, he said, I'm taking it all. And he said, I'm going to give you something brand new. And he said, all those things are done on the cross. And so when he tells us to take up our cross and follow him, he's saying, hey, do what I did. Put that old life to death. Pick up the things that are separating you from me and get rid of those things. And grab onto the new life that I have for you. Grab onto everything that I have for you. There's a verse that I want to 
I want to read for us that uh, I, I've, I've just read a couple times this week, and it was just one of those things that just kept popping up. And, and the context of this verse is that it's talking about God and the devil. It's talking about this, this battle between good and evil. And I just, I can't help but just think about, we're going into the new year, and, and, and we hold on to hope. We hold on to this thing because at times it's all we have. And this is a good thing to hold on to, but man, it starts to burn. Man, my, my hands get tired. My arms are burning. At times, it's just easier to let go. But it is a fight to hold on to this, to get up every single morning and believe God can do something, to believe that our past is not define us, to believe that he is still good, to believe that there's still a future. But it is a battle. So I want to read this to give you guys maybe just a little bit of encouragement. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, They conquered him, being the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives, even to the point of death. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. They conquered him not by their best efforts, not by trying a little bit harder, but they conquered him by the one who's conquered it all, by the power of Jesus. So we have hope this new year, not because we have better ideas and because we're going to try a little bit harder, but because Jesus has already gone before us. And so whatever the future holds, whatever is in our future, we are confident and we can hold hope because God is already there. Jesus has already overcome everything, and we just trust in him. But did you catch this? And by the word of their testimony, by sharing their stories, for they did not love their lives, even to the point of death. They did not love the things that they had, even to the point of saying, God, I'm willing to trust you with this, and I'm going to take the new life that you've given me. See, the hope for a future with God and a new life in him is worth the battle. Because it's not going to be easy, but it will always be worth it. So let me pray for you guys. God, I just pray for my church family. God, I pray that you will do what only you can do. God, some of us have come with just, just simple brokenness. God, we have nothing else, but God, we know that that's enough because we have you. God, I pray that you will bless my church family, that you will, you will keep them safe this next year, but God, that you will, you will grow that hope in them. That tomorrow is better than today. That God, no matter what it is we're walking through, no matter who it is, no matter man, woman, child, or any situation, God, it is not too much for you. God, you can draw straight lines and crooked sticks. But God, it requires us to put our lives into your hands. So you've got to take our lives and make them something brand new. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.